from coast to coast and around the world, it's time to praise the Lord. Praise the Lord covers the major Christian events in America and across the world from the heart of Europe. to the tip of Africa. From the centers of Asia. To Central and South America. You're a part of the world's largest prayer and praise gathering. Joining us from the International Production Center in Dallas, Texas, are founder of End Time Ministries, Irvin Baxter, New York Times bestselling author, Jonathan Kahn, founder of Prophecy Depot Ministries, Bill Sellers, recording artist and pastor of Lenexa Christian Center, Mike Berkey, ready to take calls, prayer partners from around America. the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. No, this is not behind the scenes. This is praise the Lord. So I should have just said, welcome, welcome, welcome. Let's have church. church. Mike Perky, how are you? Hi, Paul. Doing good. I had good. heard someone told me you had died and gone to heaven. I just... <laughs> well, I'm back. He's back. I'm and back. we are going to have church tonight. And this is going to be a very special historic night. How many believe that we are at least near to the coming of the Lord? Wave at me out there. Let me see you. Way up in the balcony there. Everybody wave big at me. Oh, Lord, if you don't believe it before this night's over, you will believe it. Because we have three prophecy experts here tonight. At least they tell me they are. And uh, we're going to make them prove it tonight in Jesus' name. Now, before we sing a song, Michael Perky, uh, Mike, by the way, if you have missed him, as I have for quite a little while, he is pastor of Lenexa Christian Center in Lenexa, Kansas, Len Lenexa, Kansas which is uh, just across the line from uh, Kansas City. Yeah, we're just right in Kansas City. Kansas City, yeah. Kansas. And uh, he's going to be our musician tonight over here in the music set. Do you, do you love this? Somebody uh, get me a picture. I, I got to tell you one little story while I'm standing right here. That beautiful picture back here, uh, Steve, get a good shot of it. That is a Lewis Comfort Tiffany original. They virtually gave it to us, but they said if you had to buy that today, it would be worth at least $100,000. So it'll be here till Jesus comes. And the story is we had already built the opening, we had built the columns, we built everything. And would you believe when we bought that, it went in there just like we had designed it for it. It just fit perfectly. And I just love to tell the Lord thank you for all the pretty things. My little sweetheart, Jan, oh, she gets criticized for all of the fancy sets. All she does is put a little gold paint on everything. Solomon put real gold on, <laughs> on his temple. <laughs> but I think my sweetheart Jan did a pretty good job. What do you think? You'll get some nice pictures of all of this lovely set here this evening. Uh, before we sing, uh, my son Matthew is my affable co-host tonight. Amen. And uh, son, take it away and at least introduce our very special guests on the program tonight. Yes, sir. First of all, what is the definition of affable? 
<laughs> affable? Uh, affable is uh, uh, nice, pleasant, uh, whatever. Nice and ple... Thank you, Dad. That's beautiful. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm teaching him all kinds of new English words. He's, he's a little ignorant. Yeah, so obviously. He's... Well, actually, that's why I'm here tonight on Prophecy Night. I went to the Joel Osteen School of Prophecy, okay? So that... Get it? Because he never teaches on it. Get it? Uh, okay. How many have read the book of Revelation? How many understand the book of Revelation? <laughs> Not many. Four people claim they understand the book. Five. Okay, five people. Okay, Irvin Baxter, do you fully understand the book of Revelation? I think I understand most of it. Okay. And Jonathan Kahn, do you understand it? Some of it. Okay. What about you, Bill? I would agree with Irvin, probably most of it. Okay. So we're going to try to make sense of the book of Revelation tonight. Is that what we're here all to try to accomplish? An end time prophecy. End time prophecy. Okay. Irvin Baxter, you uh, just started the Jerusalem Prophecy College. Okay. What is that in 30 seconds or less? It's going to be in downtown Jerusalem. We're getting ready to purchase a property there. We're going there to take the message that Jesus is the Messiah to his kinsmen, to the ones that gave us the Bible, they gave us our Messiah. Mm. Now we're going to give back. Okay. Perfect. And uh, Jonathan Kahn. Yes. A lot of people in this audience, this audience, you, uh, you've heard of this book, The Harbinger, yes? Okay. Mm. We're going to be talking about that tonight. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what uh, you're here to talk about. How does mm -hmm. that fit into Revelation in, in 30 words or less? The Harbinger is kind of filling in the connection between where we are now and where we're going to end up. And okay. What's, the Harbinger is a foreshadow or warning, in this case, a warning of judgment and concerning where we are in America and where we are heading in the end. Okay. Bill, Psalm 83 is your latest book. And... Uh, how does that fit into what we're discussing tonight? Well, Psalm 83 is an ancient prophecy that has been overlooked by many of today's top scholars that appears to be a prophecy for our time that could occur, it could be imminent. And the things we're seeing in the Middle East right now could be indicative of this ancient prophecy about ready to find fulfillment. Got it. My affable father, yes. uh, <laughs> please take it over again. Yes, thank you, my affable son. Thank you. Good. I've got a few other words that I'll teach you, some of my good old Missouri colloquial terms, like, uh, well, I taught you one the other day, yeah, and I, I, gotcha. I can't remember now. Yeah. Anyhow, Mike Perky, are you ready to take us to church? He, he opened up a, a whole album a few years ago, and it just went nuts. Everybody loved it so much. And if you haven't heard it, well, get ready to sing and shout and Praise the Lord, because uh, it's simply what it says. Let's have church. Amen. Let's do it. Come on, Mike. Right. Praise God. Help me, everybody. Come on. Clap your hands with me. Jesus. 
his name. Well, if you feel the way I do, somebody get out of your seat and let the spirit move you from your head down to your feet. Bring up the music. Let's have a church. Well, let's forget about ourselves and put Jesus first. Well, let's clap our hands and testify about his body works. Bring up the music. Let's have a church. Testify about his mighty words, bring up the music. Let's have, let's have a show. Yeah. Oh, Lord. Oh, man. We could, we could go home right now and feel like we've been to church, I think. <laughs> Mike Perky, God love you. He'll be back and sing some more great songs for us before Mike this Perky night. Mike Perky is our affable music tonight. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Got yes, he is. Very affable. He is a little corny, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but us Midwesterners, we love him. Missouri, we love him. We love him. He's our, yeah, New York, California, you know. All the fruits and nuts are on the East Coast and West Coast. The normal people are here in Texas and in the yeah. center. I thought for a second I was going to have to remind you that we're on the air right now. Yes. Ooh, okay, uh, yeah. I forgot. I forgot. Anyhow, uh, let me uh, start. I am, I'm happy to see my good friend uh, Irvin Baxter here. I, I, I know him. I've met Jonathan for the first time tonight, and also Brother Bill for the first time tonight. And uh, we are going to talk about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, I hope, you know, you win some people through love, through sweetness and light and so forth, and some people come to Christ after you scare the hell out of them. <laughs> and. Uh, we're on the air, Dad. Yes, yeah, I know. Okay, I um, a friend of mine that you'll see a little clip in a moment, Doug Clark, he, he told me he got saved one Sunday night in a red-hot evangelistic sermon on hell, fire, and damnation, and he came to Christ down, running down the altar with a coattail on fire. Gotcha. And he got saved that night. So different strokes for different folks, I guess, is yeah. the way it goes. Anyway, um, 28 years ago, and I saw the rerun. You know, it's too late here in Texas. Jan plays some of those old classic Praise the Lord programs mm -hmm. starting at 11.30 California time. So 11.30, 12, be 1.30 here. So for you night owls, 1.30 to 3.30 is uh, some of the old classic. From the 80s, from, yeah. From the 80s. Yeah. This one I saw the other night was from February of 1985. Mm -hmm. And it was a night that we had Hal Lindsey, Dr. Stuart McBurney, and Doug Clark. Three, at that time, very well known. Of course, Doug, Hal Lindsey is still very well known. Yeah. McBurney is in heaven, and Doug Clark is in Canada, I think. Anyway, they took the three popular positions, whether Jesus is coming in the rapture, before the rapture, before the tribulation, in the middle of the seven-year tribulation, or at the end of the tribulation. And uh, for just two minutes, relive with me just a tiny little taste of that program that was done 28 years ago, about this month. It's time to praise the Lord. Well, this is the night you've been waiting for. Yes, this happened several weeks ago. I'll never forget. I believe Doug was on, and I had heard his position on end times and the coming of the Lord, and I said, you know, I sit here and <laughs> I listen to you, I, I hear Dr. McBurney, I hear Hal Lindsey, I hear other prophecy preachers and teachers, and I said, some night, I'm going to get the whole lot of you together at one time in one place, and we're going to have at it. All right, the pre, 
tribulation position. The day of the Lord and the rapture are not the same things. The day of the Lord includes the seven-year tribulation and the thousand-year reign of, of uh, the Messiah. I do not believe that the rapture and the day of the Lord occur at the same time. I believe that Christ will come in the middle of the tribulation because when I turn to the book of the Revelation, I find, and this is astounding to me, that the Antichrist is not mentioned until the 13th chapter of the book of the Revelation. And it is in the 11th chapter of the book of the Revelation where we see the rapture. The post-trib position is, without attacking myself, that at that moment we're resurrected from the dead, we're translated and raptured from among the living, we've gone through the seven years of the tribulation, we've gone to the Bema seat, we've just received our rewards, we're now at the marriage supper of the Lamb, Revelation chapter 19, and by the time 45 days is over, we've had a picnic in heaven, we've just come back, and now we're taking over the world, and we have the judgment of the living nations. God spoke to me two words. And I'll never forget them as long as I live. He simply said, be ready. Amen. Be ready. <laughs> All right. That was just a little taste of uh, our discussion of 28 years ago. And oddly enough, as I watched that whole program, everything they said was very much up to date. Nothing had transpired to gainsay anything that they had spoken about. So uh, here we are from 1985 to the year 2013. Lord, I never thought I'd, yeah. if I knew I was going to live this long, I'd have took better care of myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, anyhow, let's start each one with just a little preamble to your constitution. As to, Brother Baxter, why do you believe we are near to the coming of the Lord? Because all the prophecies that are supposed to happen just before His coming are taking place right now. Example, one world government. World Bank, World Health Organization, World Trade Organization, globalization, all of those things are indicated that we're watching world government formed right now. That's one reason. Also, there are seven trumpets in the book of Revelation. I believe I can prove that five of those have already sounded, and we're on the brink of the sixth one right now. The seventh one is the, is the coming of the Lord. So that's just a very short synopsis of why I believe we're near the coming of the Lord. Okay. I've got a couple of hard questions for you in just a little bit. Um, Brother Kahn, mm -hmm. Jonathan Kahn, you are a Jewish believer, I yes. understand. Yes. Um, you're not so much into the pre, mid, post, but mm -hmm. brother, I have, I have read much of your book and, and I have seen your whole DVD on The Harbinger and it nearly scared the hell out of me. <laughs> <laughs> and we laugh, but he, you may not be laughing after he gets done with us tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, Jonathan, tell us, why are, why are we near to the coming of the Lord? Because what the Bible says will happen in the end times is happening. I'm uh, just being here, I'm a Jewish believer, that's one of the signs. So it, it says, <laughs> yes. you know, Jesus said, you won't see me again until you say, Baruch haba b'ashem Adonai. So he said, you, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. For that to happen, the Jewish people had to survive, they had to come back to Israel, because that's where he said it, had to come back to Jerusalem, that's where he said it, and they had to come back to him. And mm -hmm. it is happening. 1948, prophecy fulfilled. That's the key sign, Israel back in the world. 1967, Jerusalem, key sign, he's got to come back to Jerusalem. Right. And then the other key, and, and the other thing is the Jewish people have to come back to him. That is beginning. More Jewish people are coming back to Messiah as the Jewish Messiah now than any time since the book of Acts. So it is happening. We are in the neighborhood. We're here. And we're a sign of that. Amen. Tell Jonathan about our new studio coming together oh. in the city of Jerusalem and why we need to get him at that studio and do some programs. <laughs> Why do I have to tell you? You just told him. I mean, just kind of, you were just kind of looking at me when you well, said it. So, Jonathan, you need to come do programming at our new studio. Okay. okay. No, but you know what? It, you know what's so beautiful about that studio, and and it is in in the city, uh, right in Jerusalem. You can see in your immediate foreground Mount Zion. Yes. 
Mount Moriah, mm -hmm. and the Mount of Olives, okay? It's kind of the view that Fox News would have wanted mm -hmm. if they built mm -hmm. a studio in yeah. Jerusalem, okay? Exactly. Right over your shoulder, you can put the gold dome of Mount Moriah mm -hmm. and the Mount of Olives, and it. it's just beautiful, okay? Mm -hmm. So we invite you at any time. But one sure. significant thing is that in 1948, mm -hmm. when, when Jerusalem was divided east and west, Moshe Dayan, yes. and it became a nation. Well, and, and Jerusalem was divided, yes? yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Moshe Dayan, the one-eyed general, yes. correct? He drew a line through east to separate east and west Jerusalem. Yes? Mm -hmm. So far, I'm, I'm right, right? Sounds right. Yep. Irvin, am I right so far? No, that is 1948? right. 1948? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, I even know that. Okay. <laughs> when he drew the line on the map to define okay. east to west Jerusalem, the pin line went right down through our property line. Mm. Mm. I think symbolically mm. saying mm. that that studio is for both with one hand the Jew and one hand the Arab. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful mm -hmm. example of just, and by the way, how do you say the word Hananiah? Is that, is that a, uh, did I just make a uh, real yeah, word? Or, or Hananya. Hananya. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and that means our the grace uh, of God. If the it's grace the same of God, one. yeah, Hananya. Our studio oh. is on Mount Hananya. Hananya. Now you know how to pronounce it. Hananya, the grace, and the the, 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 hill of of grace, the hill of grace, the, the grace of God, God hill, yeah. overlooking Mount Zion, Mount mm. Moriah, and the Mount of Olives. Mm. You're That's welcome awesome. to come anytime. <laughs> That's, great. That's great. Isn't that awesome? That's awesome. Wonderful. And Irvin, I told him the same thing. Come, come, mm. come. Make programs. Mm. Get us Six more excited. Story building, wow. big indoor studio wow. and exterior studio. Yeah, awesome. God, thank you. Okay, number three, Bill S Salas. Boy, I have read Psalm 83 all my life and never really put the significance upon it that you have. Uh, tell us why you believe the coming of the Lord is near. Well, I agree right off the bat with Jonathan. The super sign of the end times was the nation of Israel. Christ referred to that in Matthew 24 mm -hmm. as the fig tree, where six, 65 years they celebrate their 65th birthday on May 14th. Wow. 65 years deep into the end times. I agree with Irvin in that there's no weapon that hasn't been fashioned, national relationship that hasn't been formed, or technology that has not been developed that could not find every final Bible prophecy, find fulfillment soon and sequentially. And remember Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 8, that the end times events would be characterized like birth pangs. So in other words, when the end times events start to happen, like a, mother, uh, a woman about to crown a baby, her, her contractions become much more intense and they become much more frequent and you cannot hold that back. And I think these end time signs, as they start building up the wars in the Middle East and things like that, each one's going to build upon the other. Each one's going to get more intense and become more frequent together and compacted, much like the birth pains. In a moment, we'll come back and I'll give you the floor and we'll get into Psalm 83. Great deeply and beautifully and reverently. Uh, just before I start with Dr. Baxter here, um, Mr. Director, give me a, a, a shot of my board here. I think we can all see this simple timeline. Here's the cross of Jesus. The nearly 2,000 years of grace are almost transpired. Uh, depends on whether you count the birth of Christ or mm. the resurrection and ascension of Christ. Uh, then we know that there will be a seven-year tribulation, three and a half years, three and a half years, ending with a thousand-year millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Now, the pre-tribulation <coughs> folks believe Jesus is coming. Where's my pen? Is it down right here? There. They believe that he's coming just... This old pen isn't working very well, Matthew. They believe that Jesus is coming just any day now, before the beginning of the seven-year tribulation. Uh, the mid-tribbers believe he's coming halfway through at about three and a half years. And Dr. Baxter is going to convince you tonight that Jesus is coming in the rapture at the end of the seven years of tribulation. I think for some of our beginners, uh, Dr. Baxter, can you, just in a nutshell, explain to us Daniel's 70 weeks and why we believe that this last one week. Give us a little quick preview of that or review of that before you get into your position on the coming of the Lord. In Daniel 9, 27, 
it speaks about a 400, uh, hold on a minute, let me recycle my brain here, a uh, 490 year prophecy. 90. It divides it up into three segments. Seven weeks of years, 432 weeks of years, and one week of years. A week of years is seven year period. Mm -hmm. So it's 49 years, 434 years, and seven years. Now the Bible says very clearly in verse 26 of Daniel 9 that after the 69 weeks, Messiah will be cut off. Yes. And the people of the prince that shall come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now, this is absolute proof that Jesus had to be the Messiah. Yes. Because it says, after the 483 years, Messiah will be cut off, and then the people of the prince that shall come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. We know for sure when that happened. That happened in 70 AD when the Roman armies under Titus destroyed Jerusalem. Yes. So the Messiah has to come first, then be cut off, then Jerusalem destroyed. Now we know there's a gap between the 69th and the 70th because we know Jesus was crucified somewhere between 30 and 37 AD. But yet Rome was not destroyed until 70 AD. So we've got at least a 30 year gap mm -hmm. before the final seven years begins. Okay. The truth of the matter is we've got a 2000 year gap. And when that final seven years begins, the Bible says the Antichrist will confirm the Abrahamic covenant with many for seven years. In the middle of seven years, uh, he will uh, cause the sacrifice and oblation to stop, and that will begin the final three and a half years. Okay. He went through that pretty fast, and I'm sure some of you didn't quite get it. Just take our word for it that every okay. <laughs> prophecy expert that I know of agrees that we are coming up close to the final seven years. That 70th week of Daniel. We're coming very close to that. <clears throat> and as I said, we'll know when that begins because when some political leader signs a seven-year treaty to protect Israel mm -hmm. and to mm -hmm. secure Israel, that will be, I think, the trigger, isn't it, when the seven years begin? Absolutely. Now, the pre-tribbers say, we'll be gone, we won't see that, we won't know that. Um, the mid-tribbers say, oh yeah, we'll see that. We'll even live through the first three and a half years of approximately of that seven years because the Jews have to rebuild their temple in, in that period of time uh, because in the middle, we know what happens, the abomination that make us desolate, the, uh, the uh, Antichrist is going to come into the rebuilt temple proclaim himself to be God, and uh, mm -hmm. he will fulfill. Well, I think in the, what do we call the tunnel period between the last book of the Bible and Matthew, the first book, mm -hmm. that 400-year period, we call that the tunnel the, period. The silent years. Yeah. yeah, and that was when the Maccabees. Maccabee, the whole, yeah, the whole story of Hanukkah is in the middle of the Old and New Testament. Right, yes. right. And that's a foreshadow of all that you're saying. Right. And in that period, remember the, uh, the king of uh, uh, Syria came and slaughtered a pig yes. on the holy altar yes. of the temple, yes. which was called the abomination of desolation because to a Jew, a yeah. pig is an evil, filthy yeah. animal. And to think of yeah. killing it on the, on the holy altar where only a lamb yeah. should have been offered was, was an absolute abomination. abomination. Yeah. And that was a precursor of what the, uh, what's his name? The Antichrist, the Antichrist will do yes. in the middle of this seven year period and will finally yeah. reveal who he is to the world. Yeah. Now, uh, okay, with that understood, then at the end of that seven years, uh, that's when the devil gets cast into the bottomless pit. Oh, I love that scripture in the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. I've told the Lord, if, if he needs my help, I'll be there and I'll give him an extra kick as he goes. Because <laughs> that old boy has bothered me. How about you? And I'm mad at him. And I, I, I do him dirt as often as I can. Uh, then, then comes the thousand year reign of Jesus, the millennial reign. Uh, from the throne of his ancestor David on what? Will it be on Mount Hananiah? 
<laughs> I hope so. No, it'll be on the Temple Mount. On the Temple Mount. He might broadcast from the other mount, but, but <laughs> yeah. he'll, be, he'll rain from the Temple Mount. We'll get pictures of him <laughs> get from, our, pictures. from our studio, <laughs> yes. Okay, uh, Dr. Baxter, end times prophecy. Oh, boy. I have watched all of your DVDs, and so I know pretty well how you uh, stand in this area of prophecy. But go ahead. Tell us. Give us your reasons why you believe the coming of Jesus is near, but also why you believe the church is going to actually have to live and go through the whole seven years of tribulation before Jesus comes in the rapture to get us. What I don't understand about you guys, if Jesus is coming in the rapture at the end of the seven years, then we turn right around and go right back up to heaven, don't we? I, I don't, please explain that to me. You've done quite a good job of teaching <laughs> prophecy already. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. First of all, let's see if I can position myself here. Many people do teach a... Stand back as far as possible and just use your arm out there. Many people do teach a seven-year tribulation, but it's surprising there's not one scripture in the Bible that teaches a seven-year tribulation. Really? Not one. There are five scriptures in the Bible that teach a three and one half year tribulation. And Jesus taught the tribulation begins here. He said, when you see the abomination of desolation, then if you live in Judea, you must flee, yes. because then will be great tribulation. The scriptures that teach a three and a half year tribulation, Daniel 7, 25, the little horn comes up, uproots three, and then makes war against the saints for time, times, and a half. Mm -hmm. Then Revelation chapter 13, verse number 5, power was given unto the beast to continue 42 months. The reign of the Antichrist will be this final 42 months right here. Daniel, uh, Revelation chapter number 12, verse number 5 and 6, Satan makes war against the woman, Israel, for 1,260 days. That's three and a half years. And then Jesus said, the great tribulation begins the abomination of desolation, which is here. So in my opinion... This is the tribulation. This is not tribulation at all. Well, how do we get away with the 70th week of Daniel? Well, the 70th week of Daniel is this whole thing, right. And it starts with the confirmation of the covenant. But the first three and a half years, the peace deal is working. Yeah. And this is when the temple is being built and everything looks good. Well, it's the first half of the what we would call the tribulation. It's the first half of Daniel's 70th week. But yes. It's semantics, so it's not that important. All right. But the important thing is, in my opinion, there's no such thing as mid-trib. You're either here, pre-trib, or you're post, because this is not tribulation at all. Now, that's my opinion. Now, why do I believe that the rapture occurs here? Because Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 29 through 31, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars will fall from heaven, then shall appear the sign of the coming of the Son of Man, and he will send his angels to gather his elect from the four winds. Now, some people have tried to say the elect is the Jews. Then mm -hmm. you have to have two raptures. You have to have a Christian rapture and the Jewish rapture, if mm -hmm. you believe that, which the Bible doesn't <laughs> teach anywhere. But if you look the elect up in an exhaustive concordance, it's 13 times in the New Testament. Once it speaks of Jesus, once of an angel, the other 11 times, it's of the church, if you'll look carefully. So the Bible says the elect will be gathered here at this place. And it also says, back here during this three and a half years, Jesus warned the disciples, if they say unto you, Messiah is in the desert, don't go forth. Now, if we're already gone, why is he warning his church during this final three and a half years? If they say Messiah is in the desert, don't go forth. Well, won't there be a lot of lukewarm Christians that miss the rapture? And uh, there will be some mid-tribulation saints that come to Christ refusing to take the mark of the beast. But if the rapture happened here, the whole world's going to know it. I mean, cars have run up telephone poles, planes have flown, fallen out of the sky. It's going to be the most dramatic event if it's going to occur, which I, I don't believe it is. Okay. But if it's going to occur, everybody's going to know the rapture happened here. But the Bible very clearly, and Jesus wasn't talking to non-church people. He was talking to his disciples. We're built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. He was speaking to his disciples and he said, during this time, if they say unto you, he's in the desert, don't go forth. If they say unto you, he's in the secret chambers, don't believe it. Why? Verse 27. 
For as the lightning flashes out of the east and cometh even unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. It's not going to be a secret appearance somewhere in, in Bethlehem. No. When I come back, the reason you should not go chasing these reports of desert, secret places, is because when I come back, and he's speaking about future from this point right here, he said it's going to be as the lightning flashes from the east to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So well, that is the second coming, isn't it? That's the rapture and the second coming. It's the same thing. Okay. Well, we know the second coming because Zechariah 14, his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount yes. of Olives, which is before Jerusalem to the east. So we know his second coming will be at the end of this seven-year period or end of this three-and-a-half-year period, whatever you want to call it. But the rapture, he could be gathering his elect. That could be some of the folks who have finally realized that they missed the rapture up here earlier, and they have come to Christ, and they're I was taught in my theological seminar that, that there will be tribulation saints. They will come to Christ all through the tribulation, refusing to take the mark of the beast because now they realize that they have missed the rapture, and so they're coming to the Lord now. I was taught that too. Okay. And I used to believe pre-trip. However, once I saw it says that he comes here and gathers his saints, then I still tried to rationalize, well, maybe it is the Jewish saints or whoever turned to Jesus during the tribulation. But then I got in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, and it says, I saw those that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of their testimony. They did not worship the beast, nor did they, did they take his number. And it says, these lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And it says, this is the first resurrection. This resurrection that happens after the mark of the beast. It says that when they're resurrected, this is the first resurrection. I'll never forget the day I saw that scripture and I said, wait a minute, God. What about my resurrection back here? If this is the first one, what's this one? I okay. couldn't answer the question. Let me, let me tell you how that is answered. Let me think a minute here. Well, uh, <laughs> let, me, let me say, first of all, Who's right, you or Irvin? Well, you're not sure yet? I'm not sure. Okay. I'm not sure. Okay. We're going to, because I'm not either, so. Now you've made me lose my well, complete you, train of thought. You had <laughs> lost it and I jumped in to help you. Okay. So. While yeah. you're thinking about that. No, no, no. I, I got it. Okay. I got it. All right. Many believe that that first resurrection comes in stages. First of all, we know Jesus was resurrected first. He was the first fruits. Yes. And then Matthew tells us that some of the saints that were dead were raised with Jesus and were seen around Jerusalem, a scene of many. So that is a resurrection. That happened the same time that Jesus was raised, right? Yeah, but yes, basically the same time. And then um, in uh, now. You've already answered my question, but here's, here's the other answer. Revelation 11 talks about it's time for the dead to be judged and the, rather the uh, uh, something to be given to the saints. Rewards to be given uh, to the prophets, the re saints. Rewards yes. to the prophets, the saints, and to the, everybody. And uh, Dr. McBurney, of course, believed that that was the actual resurrection the, the first resurrection of the saints in the middle of the tribulation, uh, and that was the first rapture. And then that, uh, because he just said, there's no possible way that the church is going to have to go through that last three and a half years of the most horrible, hideous time on earth. We're, the church is just going to be beat up, knocked down, and dragged out, and in a mess when Jesus comes for us. <laughs> Well, it can't be much worse than what the early apostles went through. Eleven out of twelve of them died a True. martyr's death. All right. Uh, however, let me just see if I can give you the short version if I can. There are four specific accounts of the second coming in the book of Revelation. The first one is Revelation 6. Now, when you say the second coming, you mean when Jesus' feet literally touch down on earth. Yes. When he comes back, the Bible says we're going to be caught up to meet him in the air, have the marriage supper in the sky. What's the longest supper you've ever been to? A few hours. Yeah. Okay. Have the merry supper in the sky. Then we will come with him to the Mount of Olives. 
He'll put his feet there on the Mount of Olives. The Jews will rush out to meet him. They will convert to Jesus. We'll go forth and destroy the Antichrist and the false prophet, and we'll crown Jesus King of kings and Lord of lords. All That's right. the way I believe it's going to happen. Okay. Let me give you four specific accounts of that in the book of Revelation. Good. The first one is chapter 6. The heavens depart like when the sixth seal is open, the heavens depart like a scroll. The rich men of the earth cry out and say, Fall on us, hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne, for the wrath of the Lamb is come. That's in chapter 6. Hmm. You get to chapter 11, the scripture you quoted, verse 15, the, la the last trumpet sounds, like Paul said, the last trump will be changed. The last trumpet sounds, and the Bible says, the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ. That happens here. Jesus takes over here. That's chapter 11, verse 15. The kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ. And then it goes on to say, and the time came that the prophets should be given their rewards and all those things. Because right. it's the establishment of the kingdom, we now move into the rulership of the Jesus Christ and His church. That's chapter 11. We see another rapture in chapter 14. To harvest. There's an angel sitting on the cloud. He thrust in his sickle to reap, and the harvest of the earth is reaped. And Immediately thereafter, another angel having a sharp sickle was also commanded to reap the vine of the earth. He cast in his sickle, he reaps the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great wine press. And blood came out of the wine press by the space of 1,600 furlongs. These are the two simultaneous. Uh, reapings. It's the harvest of the wheat and the harvest of the tares. Matthew 13, mm -hmm. harvest of the wheat, harvest of the tares. At the same time, Jesus taught. That's the same thing in Revelation chapter number 14. So the rapture happens there. Now go over to chapter number, am I skipping one? I've got chapter 6, chapter 11, chapter 14, chapter 19. Now if the book of Revelation is in chronological order, we got a huge problem because the marriage of the Lamb hasn't happened in chapter 19. Mm -hmm. It says, come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. And the bride has made herself ready. Next thing you see, here he comes on his white horse. And as he comes, he comes down. His name is written, the Word of God. Yes. And he goes down to fight the battle of Armageddon. And the voice goes out saying, gather the birds of the air, the beasts of the field, to the great supper of our God. Mm -hmm. And he takes the Antichrist, the false prophet, casts them in the lake of fire. And then move on to verse 20, and we get to throw the devil in the bottomless pit. Yes. So, four accounts of the rapture. Chapter number 6, chapter number 11, chapter number 14, chapter number 19. Okay, are you all taking notes on this? <laughs> Let me ask you, while you're standing, let me ask you. The, the one problem that, that I and many have, if the rapture is at the end of this uh, seven or three and a half year period, you just said the marriage supper of the Lamb, and also where does the bema, the judgment seat of Christ occur? Uh, the Bible says if you're sin, your sins before you to the judgment... Some men's sins go before them to the judgment. The judgment seat of Christ is when they, you give the rewards to the prophets. Yes. This is not a judgment of saved or lost. No, no, I understand it's that. A save, it's a judgment of, of rewards, which you just quoted. But in, when is it? Okay, it happens here at, when, at the Mary's Supper. At the Mary's Supper is where the rewards. thousands of people that will be big, given rewards. Is that going to happen in just a, a, a few hours? Yes, because we're all immortal. We're not going to have to be trained. We're going to know instinctively because the Bible says, "Now we know in part; then we shall know as he is. We will know as he is. We will know as we are known. Yes. We will immediately be engrafted in the mind of God. We'll know everything God knows. God will know everything. He knows uh, everything we yes. know now. So, so it's not instantly. It's instantly. That's correct. Okay. Well, that answers that. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, Brother Freetred, we'll give you the floor in just a moment. Uh, whew, all I know is a be lot ready. Of, a lot of yes, a lot of very interesting things are happening, and I think all of us realize that. Even oh, so many signs. Like one of the great signs we talked about 28 years ago was the coming great falling away or the apostasy, as the Bible speaks of. Oh Jesus! You know, I never dream that I would live to see a Buddhist in the Senate of the United States and a Hindu in the uh, Congress. Congress of the United States and a Muslim be given the floor to give the opening prayer. Oh, wow. 
for the Congress to begin its work. Did you ever think you'd live to see something did. like that? Never did. Mm. Let me tell you, folks, the apostasy is upon us. Yes, it is. Mm. And if ever we, one thing that I don't have to argue with anybody about, it is harvest time. It is time to tell people the coming of the Lord draws nigh. That's right. You better get ready. That's right. Amen. Yeah. Amen. 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 And now, you better buckle up your spiritual seat belt tight now because Jonathan Kahn has written a book. It's been on the New York Times bestseller how many weeks? About 60 something weeks now. 60 weeks. 60 something. Over, yeah. over a yeah. year. Yeah. Over a year? Yeah, over a year from the first week it came out until this week. The Harbinger, the Harbinger. Tell us again, for those that just tuned in, what does that term mean? <clears throat> harbinger means a foreshadow or a warning of something to come. Okay. Yeah. And you have found several yes. of those foreshadowing or those harbingers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Take us through them quickly. Yeah. yeah. The Harbinger is the revealing of an ancient mystery from the Bible that is lies behind everything from 9-11 to the collapse of the American economy. And that's so specific that it foretells Amer events right now that are happening down to the hours, down to the dates. It gives the exact words that American leaders speak before they speak them. It's as if we're replaying this ancient biblical mystery that's happening in America right now. And since the book came out, it's actually continuing to come true. Uh, what this is is that in the last days of ancient Israel, before its destruction as a nation, there were nine harbingers or signs of judgment, warning, warning the nation to come back to God because okay. they, yeah. This was back uh, how many years before Christ? This is about, this is about seven centuries before about Christ. About seven before centuries. Yeah. And we know that, what, Syria came. Yes. And invaded Israel. Yes. And destroyed them. That's where you get the ten lost tribes. Exactly. Yeah. The, with the ten lost tribes but, ended yeah. up Somewhere we don't yeah. know yet. They're, yeah. they're, they're still lost. Something there in New Jersey, but that's not. <laughs> but, but before that destruction happened, these the God was giving warnings. And the scary thing, or the eerie thing, or the stunning thing, is that those same nine harbingers are now reappearing on American soil. Okay, so the same warnings that God gave to Israel, warning that their destruction was imminent. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yes. eight, nine. Yes. Are mirrored in the nine harbingers that have come or yeah, are have already come yes, to pass. and are continuing, yes. In the United States of America. Yes, All yes, right. exactly. <laughs> Tell us. Yeah, well, the first, the first warning of a nation, and this is a nation that had known God but had turned away from God. Uh, they got into sexual immorality. They lifted up their children as sacrifices, and God called them and warned them, and finally he allowed this to happen. The first warning is this breach of the nation's security. To, that, is, to Israel. Israel. Yeah, first there's this strike. It's a wake-up call. It's a shaking. Mm -hmm. And they don't turn back. They defy God. And so they, and they make a vow. And the vow is in Isaiah. And this is the key of the harbingers, this vow that they make. Once the attack happened, they said, the bricks have fallen in this attack, but we will rebuild with hewn stone. The sycamores have been cut down in this attack, but we will plant cedars in their place. What they're saying is, God, you're not going to humble us. We're not going to come back. We're going to come back against you, and we're going to come back stronger as a nation against you. And this is, going to lead, this is going to seal their destruction. We can do it without you, God. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And so what happened is, so now we have America. America is a nation that had known God, has, has been founded on yes. His Word like Israel was, and has been blessed as Israel was. But now America is the nation that's driving God out of its life. America is the nation that's lifting up its children. America is the nation that is promoting sexual immorality and God. calling good evil and evil good. And no nation can be so blessed as we've been blessed and then have the blessing continue. So the first sign, the first strike is always, the first warning is this strike, this hedge of protection is lifted up temporary. It is limited. It, is, it, is, it happens once. It's to shake up the nation. And it happens on September 11th, 2001. We, it was a wake-up call. People were flocking to churches. We thought there was going to be revival. You know, it looked like there could have been revival. Yeah, yeah. But there wasn't because without repentance, there is no revival. And there was no repentance. And, God help us. And so... 
So now the eerie thing is the same nine harbors begin to appear in America. And I'll just touch on some of them, just a quick touch on them. First of all, the, one of the things that happens is that, that it says in Isaiah, it says, the bricks have fallen, but we will rebuild with hewn stone. The word in Hebrew is gazit stone. It means a massive rectangular block of stone they got from mountain rock. And it's their sign of defiance. We're coming back strong and we're going to build just where the bricks fell. We're going to take the stone. We're going to build stronger than ever, higher than ever. Well, after 9-11, the people of New York go up to the mountains of New York. They quarry out a massive rectangular block of stone. It's a <gasps> biblical gazette stone. They bring it back. According to the mystery, it's got to go back to the ground of destruction. They bring it to ground zero. They lower it on the pavement. They have a ceremony around the stone. They have leaders of New York and New Jersey vowing vows of defiance over the stone, even using the words that are quoted in the commentaries about Isaiah 9:10. And they do it. And it's like, it's like, Paul, it's like they're replaying this mystery. Nobody's knowing what they're doing. Doing, it's manifesting. The next thing, write down Isaiah. It says, it says, the sycamores have been struck down. So according to the mystery, and this in the in the harbinger, this is the sixth harp, the sixth sign, and that is that the sign of the sycamore being struck down. When the Assyrians came in, they struck down the, the trees, the sycamore. A biblical sign of national uprooting, warning. It happens in the Bible a few times. So for this sign to happen, somehow the sign of the sycamore would have to appear in New York City. Well, it's, you wouldn't expect that there, but here's something eerie happens. In the last moments of 9-11, the last tower comes down. It sends forth a shock wave, sends forth a beam into the air, strikes an object. The object happens to be a tree. The tree is the sycamore. The in sycamore New in New York City, right at the corner of Ground Zero, the sycamore has fallen, the sign of national judgment. The people of New York take the sycamore, they put it on display, call it the sycamore of Ground Zero, have no idea what they're dealing with. The next sign in the harbinger, the, se the seventh one, is the sign of the Erez tree. Write down Isaiah. It says, it, right down the line, it says, the sycamores have fallen, we will plant cedars in their place. Sign mm -hmm. of defiance, Lord. This yeah. is you, you try to humble us. We're going to take another tree, put it right where the sycamore fell, and we're going to take a different tree, a stronger one. Cedar, it says in English. In Hebrew, it's erez, meaning cedar or a spruce, a pine, strong, green, evergreen tree. Well, here's what happens. And th th this uh, this is now three years three years after 9/11 or two years. A tree appears in the sky at the corner of Ground Zero. It's being lowered on by crane to go into the exact spot of earth where the sycamore stood. I saw the picture. They're performing the exact ancient act at ground zero. And that tree, they call it the tree of hope. They have a ceremony around the tree. They speak of how we're not going to be conquered. And the tree, the tree that they put down, it's not, it's not a sycamore. It's a biblical Erez tree, the same tree of Isaiah 9:10, the tree of judgment. They have no idea what they're doing. They're reenacting the thing. And it gets even more eerie because the next harbinger is the vow itself, that the leaders of ancient Israel actually vowed this vow of defiance, and it sealed the destruction of their nation. They would have done it in the capital city, a vow of where we build, and it has to do with, has to do with this attack. That's the response. Three years after 9-11, an American leader, well, let me just say, for this to come true, an American leader would have to pronounce judgment on America. Now, what American leader in the right mind is going to do that? But three years after 9-11, a famous American leader, John Edwards, senator, gets up in Washington, D.C., and it's on the anniversary of 9-11. He's going to speak about the attack, and it's a congressional caucus, and he gets up, and out of his mouth comes the ancient pronouncement of judgment on America. He says, the bricks have fallen, but we will rebuild. He With used the, the very scripture. The exact, the exact words that were spoken in the destruction of Israel. He speaks it out of 30,000 verses in the Bible. He has no idea what he's doing, and he continues to speak. He says, we're, he makes the whole speech, Isaiah 9, 10. He says, we're going to put up the cedars. We're going to put up the, where the sycamore fell. He has no idea it's actually happening. And, Paul, on the very day after 9-11, we didn't know this because we were so traumatized by it. The American government got up on Capitol Hill to give the response to 9-11. The Congress, Senate, they're up on Capitol Hill. They appoint one man to give the response. He is the head of the Senate. He is the Senate Majority Leader, head of, which represents the nation. It's Tom Daschle. He gets up on the floor of the Senate and he gives America's response. And as he reaches the crescendo of his speech, out of his mouth he says, there is a passage from Isaiah that speaks to all of us now. And out of his mouth he begins the bricks have fallen, but we will rebuild the exact, exact words of judgment, pronouncing judgment on America without realizing what he's doing. And he's doing it. He thinks it's a good verse. He's saying the word. He's making Israel's ancient vow of judgment. Um, now it's America's. It's actually, if you look at the annals of Congress, you'll see this is our, now our response was Isaiah 9, 10 exactly. And he's speaking. People say, how can you speak like, like, he's speaking prophetically. How can you do this when, you know, if you're not a prophet? Well, Caiaphas did the same thing. He spoke prophetically 
apparently without realizing, yeah. he says, because of his office. Daschle represents the nation. And he speaks of the tree that's going to be struck down. He doesn't realize they're actually finding that tree that day. He speaks of the stone that's going to go up, and he doesn't realize that stone is actually going to happen three years later. It's going to happen there. He speaks of all the harbingers that day. And he, and he says, he actually says, this is what we will do. He's saying America will follow the path of ancient Israel, which is destruction. Isaiah 9, 10. And what it's going to do, it's prophetic, and that is that it's actually going to set the course. And so there wasn't revival when 9-11 happened. Instead, no. America has grown farther from God, much farther from God. I know. And so, and, and it's going to set the stage, we can talk about it later, but it'll set the stage for the second shaking of America, which is going to be just as much filled with uh, incredible, precise mysteries, the collapse of the American economy is going to happen exactly as, as here ordained. Well, take us quickly to one of those next harbingers when the stock market okay. literally okay. crashed yes. on yes. 08? Well, yeah, in 08, yeah, okay. Here's, here's, here's the thing with this. This is, this is kind of mind-boggling. I mean, and that is, it's called the mystery of the Shemitah. And in the Bible, there's something that, you know, every seven days they had a Sabbath. Every seven years they had a Sabbath year. They rested. There was no, no buying, selling of the fruit, no, no all that. On the last day of the Shemitah, the Sabbath year, it's called Elul 29, the 29th day of the month Elul in the biblical calendar. On that day, all the financial accounts are wiped away. Credits wiped away, all debts wiped away, all that. It was a blessing. But as Israel turned away from God and drove God out, the Shemitah becomes a sign of judgment against Israel. They're actually in captivity for the years of the Sabbath years. So it becomes a sign. So what does that have to do with America? Well, well, here's the thing. The Shemitah becomes a sign on a nation that is driving God out of its life, that has put idols ahead of God, and, that has, and, and the sign that strikes the financial realm of the nation. America, as a sign of judgment, this is what happens, the Shemitah. Here it is. The sign is the seven-year cycle. Now, 9-11, the first shaking, happened in 2001. Yeah. The second shaking, as you said, happened in 2008. That's a seven-year cycle. Secondly, when did it happen? It happened in September. It was seven years to the month of 9-11. When? The second week of September, that's when it all collapsed, the, the economy. Yes. That's seven years to the week of 9-11. In fact, when America's commemorating 9-11, on Wall Street, the second shaking is being set in motion. And the greatest day of this collapse, we're still in the shadow, the greatest day of the, the greatest collapse in American history happened at the end of September of, of 2008 when they ring the bell in the morning, the opening bell, and the bell refuses to ring that morning. They all took it as an omen. And what happened is the, the economy, it collapses, the greatest collapse in American history. When did it take place? Everything's wiped out. The greatest collapse happened on the 29th day of Elul, the biblical day of the Shemitah, appointed as a sign on a nation that has driven God out of its life, that wipes away financial accounts, that does it all. And if you go back seven years from that greatest crash, stay, to go back seven years, you get to 2001, September. You got 9-11. But you have the other greatest crash in American history at this, up to that point. When did that take place? If you take it back on the Hebrew calendar, the other greatest collapse in American history took place on the exact same biblical day of the Shemitah, Elul 29, all, everything's wiped out, the two greatest crashes, 19, both. 1929? No, 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 2001, 2001 was the other greatest crash of points in American okay. history, exactly seven years apart, seven to years. the day, to the hours. I mean, that's how mind-boggling it is. Now, we know that the stock market took a horrible... Yeah. Dump, but but it didn't wipe it completely no, out. I mean, the stocks were still there, and they still had some value, oh, and we still existed. Yeah, but yeah. the thing is that that's what happened in Israel. Actually, it wiped away the last seven years of, uh, the, the of seven. gains. Yeah, think, and yeah. Think, of, think of think of the number seven because in this in this crash, how much was wiped out? Seven percent was wiped out. How many points? Seven, seven, seven points Whoa. were wiped out Whoa. in both of them. And the, the meaning of the shemitah we were talking before is the means the release but it also means the collapse or the letting fall and the warning is and the warning is that God is saying this America is blessed as much as America has followed God if America turns away from the God of its blessings its blessings will collapse and the American age as we know it will collapse and this is a warning and a call from God as it was to Israel God is so exact have we gone too far or is it just We've gone incredibly far. You know, if you ask me, you know, if you look at what's happening, even in the world, even today, what's happening, it, it would look, America is going rapidly away from God. However, God, nothing's impossible with God. As long as there, if, I believe people say, is there any hope? If there was no hope, there'd be no harbingers. Why would there be warning if there's not hope? So can, yeah. there can be judgment and revival at the same time. And that, actually, that's one of the keys in the end times. Uh, the dark gets darker but the light better get brighter. Yeah. God is calling us to get brighter. We, we are the light of the world. Oh. We have to light it up.
Listen. Let me take you to Joel chapter 2. And he promised that there would be the former and the latter rain. Peter said, this is that that was spoken of the prophet Joel as he yes. stood on the day of Pentecost yes. uh, after Jesus had ascended to heaven. And then the, that was the former rain. Now we are going to have the latter rain. Yes. And it's, it's going to be upon all flesh. Your young men are going to see visions. Your old men are going to dream dreams. And upon our servants and my handmaidens will I pour out of my spirit. I believe we're going to see the day, dear friends, when the glory of God and the power of the Holy Spirit is going to fall so mightily, you're going to see people kneeling on street corners and in buses and on airplanes and in different places. I think it's going to be so strong. Yeah. Amen. And, and that's coming too. Amen. That's our hope, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Amen. Yes. In the there's a, there's a mystery that God has set up the entire age as a Hebrew year. Begins with Passover, ends with trumpets and tabernacles. He said, yes. oh, and in the Hebrew year, there's two reigns. And so you've got the beginning and you've got the end. And interesting, Paul, is that, that if you look at Israel, it, they just found this out recently, that there were reigns in the land, but the reign suddenly stopped in the first century after the Jewish people left and after, it stopped. And it's been empty for 2,000 years. But all of a sudden, as the Jewish people started coming back to the land, the rains began on the land again. Really? The greatest rains are, the, the, the years were 1948 and 1967. And that the, when the rains come on the Jewish people, <laughs> the rains come on the world. I mean, that the Holy Spirit is on the world. So when you start seeing these things, the Spirit came on Pentecost, when you had Jewish people repenting before God, you, you're getting that again, means also not only in the last days a time of evil, they're a time of great power of God and the yeah. outpouring of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Oh, dear Lord. It makes me want to just run out on the street corner tonight and start yelling, Jesus is coming. Well, you're kind of doing that more effectively with this television camera yes. and this television network. I okay. understand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know what? We need a little break here. Uh, Michael Perky, where are you, my son? Uh, I love all of his songs, but I love this one especially. Some call it heaven, but I call it home. And uh, we're all going home, dear friends. Whether it's at the beginning, middle, or end, we're all going, okay? I'm going with the first load, whatever that is. And uh, as the old saying is. And in a moment, uh, you, you might as well go ahead, get your Bibles out, and turn to Psalm um, 83. 83, Psalm 83, very interesting. Um, dear Brother uh, Salas is going to take us through Psalm 83 and shed some light on uh, this little timeline that I have here. Let me uh, ask a question. Uh, Mike, turn your mic on there, Mike Perky, and you're a pastor, you love this stuff. Look at the camera, don't look at us. You're standing in the dark now, yeah, there you go. And, uh, <laughs> So where, where, do, where do you stand on pre, mid, post? Where you're, you're, uh, you teach this stuff too. Look into the camera and tell us. Uh, well, you know, I've been teaching it 43 years, but uh, I'm pre-trib. I'm pre, I'm, I'm pre, I've always preached and taught pre-trib. In, in a second or two, why? Because, huh? In, in, why, why, why pre-trib? Well, because I believe that he, uh, only he who will let until he be taken out of the way. I mean, you don't want me to get into all that, do you? I mean. Well, no. <laughs> Take I mean, your liberty, brother. Come on now. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> Say something. Well, I've never heard, um, I've never ever heard a message in tongues anointed that was interpreted that ever said, get ready for the tribulation. Hmm. Well. Interesting. It's always get ready for the coming of Christ, and uh, I, I believe we're just going to be. I believe we're going to be taken out. And uh, if I'm right, then I'm in good company because Oral Roberts was that way, Brother Hagen was that way, Brother Shambach was that way, yeah. uh, all the assemblies of God's that way, all the Church of God's that way, all the Church of God and Christ are pre-trib, so it's pretty good company. Okay. okay. So what you're saying is that you're disagreeing with Brother Baxter is what you're saying right now? Yeah. Okay. I got you. I just wanted yeah, to be I mean, clear. I mean, I love him, but he, bless, bless his heart, he's wrong. <laughs> now let's sing. Amen. <laughs> 
<laughs> and he's I, probably saying, hey, well, Mike, he's, just he's sing. He's probably okay. saying that old big fat white boy doesn't know what he's talking about. But, okay. but I'll stay with my, my, my stand, and, and uh, I'm right. Okay. And you sing better, right? Y yes. Amen. And yeah, I, okay. In the name of Jesus, I'm right. Okay. Yeah. Here we go. In just a minute, Bill Solace <laughs> is uh, going to give us maybe some scriptural reasons for why he Thanks, believes. Man. Yeah, gotcha. Love you. In the uh, <laughs> uh, pre-tribulation rapture, and we'll we'll give you the floor in just a moment. Oh, great, but right now, let's bury the hatchet and sing. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere beyond the grave There is a land Where Jesus went to prepare By his own hand And for the saved by grace There Gonna be mine, yeah. Well, some call it heaven. Oh, but I call it home. Some call it dreaming. Why don't you let me dream on? Some call it paradise. Just a few more days, it's gonna be mine. Some call it heaven, but I call it home. Some call it dreaming, yeah. Why don't you? Perky, Michael Perky. You know what? Stay right there, Michael. Uh, if I don't get one more song in before Beulah Land, I just won't get it in. So let me say hello uh, to our next esteemed guest. Esteemed. Esteemed, yes. Yes, Bill <laughs> Solace. And he has written a book on Psalm 83. Yes. You're like... Me, I'm sure you've read that psalm many, many times, and I have never, ever put that into end-time prophecy mm -hmm. and the coming of the Lord and his dealing with the people of Israel and so forth. So uh, 
before we get into that heavily though, Bill, there won't be time to do very much, but tell us in a, in a nutshell or two why you are a pre-tribulation rapturist. You believe the rapture of the church of Jesus as described by Paul in uh, what, 1 Thessalonians 4, 4 verses 15 through 18, 1 Corinthians 15. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all right. sleep, we, but we shall be changed in a moment, and thinking of eye, yeah. uh, so forth. The catching away of the church. Okay, Bill, tell us, why do you believe the coming of Christ for his church and the catching up of his church into the clouds, meeting the Lord in the air, happens before the last seven years. Well, first of all, I do believe there is a seven-year tribulation, as you've got up there, divided into the two increments, three yep. and a half years each. Right. Uh, I'm so pre-trib, I don't buy post-toasties, and I don't have my wife, Tony, of 39 years, <laughs> buy green bananas. That's, that's <laughs> all. But um, there's many reasons I believe this. Uh, scripturally, uh, I, I, we're, not, we're not appointed to the wrath that is poured out on the Christ-rejecting humanity during that period of time. For instance, Romans 5, verse 9 says that through Christ we're saved from wrath. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 says he delivers us uh, from wrath. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.9 says we're not appointed to wrath. Uh, the uh, book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 10, speaking to the church of Philadelphia, calling the tribulation the hour of trial, uh, that we are kept from the hour of trial, okay? Mm -hmm. um, we're in the age of grace as you've got up there on the, the first part of the calendar. Right. Um, the bride of Christ is saved by grace through faith. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. That's Ephesians 2.8. There's nothing that the bride of Christ, represented by the church here, has to do to earn the merit to be uh, adorned to be uh, Christ's bride, okay? So, you know, we, we basically, I don't believe that Christ is going to want to take, get us after we're all battered and bruised for the worst seven years of the earth's history and come get his bride at that point. We're not appointed to that period of time. Other reasons, for instance, the Jewish wedding model. Jonathan's very familiar with this one. Um, classic example, I believe, of the rapture in that what the, the ancient Jewish wedding would be was that the, the, the uh, groom would pay a, uh, a betrothal, he'd pay a mohair, a price for his bride, then there'd be a period of separation where he would go back to prepare a place for them on his father's land. Meanwhile, the, the bride was preparing her trousseau, her, her, her gown. She didn't know when he would come back, which we're told in Revelation 19, the righteous acts of the saints is this, uh, this, 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 the, the wedding gown, for say, in this symbolism. He goes in John 14, 1, and he says, I go to my father's house, there's many mansions, I prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I would not tell you. I go, I prepare a place, and I will come and get you. So he's gone in preparation, like in the Jewish wedding model, right? The bride doesn't know when he's coming. We're to be watchful. He comes at an hour she doesn't expect. He comes with his best man and friends, and they make a noise and a shout to announce their coming. And she comes out to meet him. He doesn't usually go to the premises. Comes out to meet him, okay? Christ comes in the clouds. We meet him in the air, we're told in 1 Thessalonians. And by the way, we're told to comfort one another with these words in 1 Thessalonians 4.18. And I don't think I could comfort my brothers and sisters if I had to tell them, you're going to go through the tribulation first. The, Hebrew, the Greek word is parakaleo, and it means to encourage. Okay? So then the, the wedding model goes further. He gets his bride, and they go in for the consummation. They go in for, to be alone for seven days, perhaps representative of the seven years of tribulation, where they are then consummating their marriage and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. There's so many other reasons I could give you. Uh, Revelation chapters 2 and 3, the seven letters of the seven churches, I believe that represents a church on earth. They have multiple applications. One of them is it was a prophetic outline of the church age. Revelation 4 and 5, you see the church pictured in heaven. John said in Revelation 4, come up here, come up here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I, I, I write about them in my book, Revelation Road. You showed them on there. I write all the different reasons mm -hmm. that uh, the pre-trib rapture makes the most sense. So that's why I believe that in a nutshell. Good. You take a note, some of you are, I see. Um, yes, I, my, yes, my son. Your, your affable host uh, yeah. wants to say, co-host wants to say, if we get to vote... I take Bill's version, okay? I vote for his version, not his version, okay? Yeah, right. uh, Do you want to go through the tribulation or you want to just disappear? You want to go? Who, who wants to go at pre-trib? Yes. Okay. 
<laughs> Did the rest of you want to go? Th yeah. Ah, okay. <laughs> there's there's one little point that actually kind of helps Irwin here. Um, if we're not going through the tribulation, why are we warned not to take the mark of the beast all through this period of time? Well, that, that warning, that warning is for the people alive at the time that the, the mark of the beast that missed the rapture to them, right? Yeah, that missed the yeah. Rapture. It's a warning to them not to take okay. it because they will lose their eternal salvation. I understand that that is a point though that the post tribbers use as to uh, the well, warning. Paul, Luke twenty one thirty six. Jesus says, "Watch therefore and pray always that you could be counted worthy to escape all these things that are going to come to pass to be with the Son of Man." Um, the only way you can escape the things that are going to come, the tribulation and things like that, is to not be on this earth because it's yeah. going to affect the whole world. Yeah. So I think that you know, we need to be watchful and prayerful of the signs of the times. We need to be watchful and prayerful of our families. Are they walking the walk? Are, are we walking the walk for them so they can see Christ in us? Those types of things. As the Lord spoke to me, he just said, be ready. <laughs> we can all go to bed on that one, can't we? Michael, have you got one more song before we get into the last uh, part with Psalm 83? What are you going to sing? Oh, that going home look. How many are in favor and ready to go tonight even? Anytime. Sing it, Michael.
Michael, Michael. Going home with Michael Perky. Get his website up there. He's going to go to Nashville, my son, in a few days and do a brand new album at our little Beautiful. recording studio there in Trinity Music City, USA. Because you are my favorite singer. Yes. Or, Mike, it's just... Now, I'm, I'm just going to take a little poll here. <laughs> How many of you prefer some of this old, sweet, traditional music as opposed to some of this new modern stuff we've had on? <laughs> Let me see here. Play that me. Yeah. How many of you like uh, Michael Perky better than... Oh, I better not say it. Yeah, yeah, so. maybe not. <laughs> no, I, I won't do that. Anyhow, just stay tuned because they're counting me down to Beulah Land. That's my favorite. Anyhow, back to Bill Salas, uh, founder of Prophecy Depot Ministries. My goodness. Author, speaker, radio host, his book, several books, but the one we're going to talk about tonight is Psalm 83. Oh, brother, we need almost a whole program here, Bill, on this, but in a nutshell, tell us what uh, the very first chapter is, the missing prophetic puzzle piece. Uh, tell us why. Well, the book is called Psalm 83, The Missing Prophecy Revealed. Uh, I put that subtitle together because it was a prophecy that was overlooked by many of today's top Bible scholars. I believe it's a prophecy for our time. It's missing because it's the missing puzzle piece. When you understand it, the significance of it, the powerful attributes of it, it, it makes all the other Bible prophecies fall uh, directly in place chronologically, and it makes so much sense. No. For instance, it's a climactic including war between Israel's Arab enemies that share common borders with Israel. When they win that war, they could dwell securely, which is a condition for the war in Ezekiel okay. 38 and 39. Okay, before you get deeply into that, some of you don't have your Bibles, but you ought to just open them to Psalm 83. And let me just read just a couple of verses sure. to, to kind of set the stage. It just says, uh, this is not a Psalm of David, is it? It's a Psalm of Asaph. Asaph. He was a prophet, wasn't he? He was. Second Chronicles 29:30 says he was a seer. The Hebrew word is chozah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It means a Hebrew beholder vision, a prophet like Jeremiah or Isaiah. Good. Okay. He says, Keep not thou silence, O God. Hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God. Can I read that same thing in the, uh, in in the, the living? In the living, yes, o sir. O God, don't sit idly by, silent and inactive when we pray. Answer us, deliver us. Wow. Verse 2, let me give you a couple more verses. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. Now remember, this is a Jewish seer talking about problems that are coming to the people of Israel. Yes. Um, and listen, oh, this was, I, I had this underlined. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people, and consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, Come, and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. Mr. Ahmadinejad in uh, uh, Iraq. Iran. 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 <laughs> Read it and weep. <laughs> there have been many that have tried to take Israel, that it be no longer a nation, and they are on the ash heap, ash heap of history. Um, Psalm 83. So, now, how do you, tell me why you put this right here on my timeline at the end of the Age of Grace and the catching up of the Church of Jesus? Well, I put it there because I believe it's the event that precedes an even bigger battle, and Psalm 83 is a huge battle. But Psalm 83 involves the Arab enemies of Israel that share common borders with Israel today. And inside of them, of course, are the terrorist populations, the Hezbollah and the Hamas, and of course, the Muslim Brotherhood is emerging now as well. Yes. And so I hope we have time to kind of talk about who they all are. But their mandate is clear. They want to wipe Israel off the map that the name of Israel can be remembered no more. Israel has to deal with that. And they thus have, they will then dwell securely, which is a prerequisite for the big prophecy in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Why does it say they have to dwell securely? 
Ezekiel 30 verses 8 through 13 gives us a description of a major war that's going to be spearheaded by Russia. It have Iran, Turkey, Libya. There's nine populations in total. None of them are involved in the Psalm 83. There are different populations in Psalm 83. But we're told the Israel comes uh, out of the nations of the world in the last days. They dwell securely. They dwell in the center of the land um, without walls, bars, nor gates. And they're very prosperous because the motive, unlike Psalm 83, the motive of Russia's band is for plunder and great booty and great spoil. Mm -hmm. Now, Israel has to be dwelling securely. They have to be very prosperous. They have to be dwelling without walls, bars, nor gates for that to happen. Of course, couldn't we almost say they're in that condition right now? Well, Hezbollah's got 50,000 missiles pointed at them. Hamas was shooting missiles into Tel Aviv the other day. Yeah. Um, the Palestinians want Jerusalem. Um, Ahmadinejad is putting a nuclear program together in Iran. I, don't, I think it's quite a stretch to say that they're dwelling securely. The Hebrew words are yeshav mm -hmm. Okay. And, and what they mean biblically from precedent before is it's a security that's achieved militarily. Mm -hmm. So in other words, they earn that security. Right so now, what has not to happen? what has to happen then so that they will be dwelling securely without bars and gates and without walls? Well, they've got to deal with this confederacy that wants to cut them off that the name of Israel be remembered no more. And when I tell your listening and viewing audience who they are, you'll see that this is real-time application right now. Okay. Now, this, just let me preface it, if I can, for a moment. This prophecy was written 3,000 years ago at a time when the uh, Israelis were living in an unprecedented period of time. They were blessed by the Abrahamic covenant like never before. Mm -hmm. They had their King David. He was talking about building a temple. They were winning wars. They were expanding territorially. Mm -hmm. And Asaph gets this prophecy that is nothing short of a, a genocidal attempt of the chosen people and a confiscation of the Holy Land, the Promised Land. Mm. And it did not find fulfillment in the Old Testament. And it couldn't have found fulfillment because there was no Israel between 19, uh, 70 AD and 1948. So we're looking at it right down the barrel right now. Yeah. And since Israel became a nation in 1948, the very populations listed in Psalm 83 have been antagonizing, coming to war against Israel. Uh, you have uh, to the north, you have Lebanon, and inside of there is Hezbollah. Mm -hmm. To the northeast, you have Syria, which is in a state of flux right now with chemical weapons going all about. Yeah. Uh, you have Jordan. You have the Palestinian refugees. Palestinians are listed as the Tents of Edom in there, mm -hmm. and their ancient name. Uh, you have the Hamas, ancient Philistia. You have Egypt under the banner of the Hagarenes. That's Egypt. the Muslim Brotherhood. Yeah. You have the Ishmaelites under the banner of Ishmael, the father of the Arabs. That country is probably Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. um, so these are the enemies of Israel from time immemorial, but also since 1948, 1967, 1973. And this prophecy talks about a climactic concluding Arab Israeli war, that Israel will win. The Israeli Defense Forces today exist in fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And I point out in the book Psalm 83, The Missing Prophecy Revealed, the numerous places where they appear yeah. as the instrument used by the Lord to deal with this. I, I got real interested and, and began to see that the enemies of Israel right now, the imminent ones that are really got their missiles trained on them right now, is a, a different gang from the big gang that's coming in Ezekiel 38, 39. That's going to be Russia and uh, the, the northern powers. You, you make that clear in your book. Well, there's different things. There's different <laughs> populations. There's different motives. So the Psalm 83 people, they're coming to take the pastures of God for themselves as a possession. They want the promised land. They want to wipe Israel off the map. If this were to find fulfillment today, it would be they'd want one more Arab state and they'd want to wave the flag of Palestine over it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I call them an inner circle. It's a term I've coined because um, they all share common borders with Israel versus the outer ring you're talking about. They're predominantly Muslim countries in both coalitions, except Russia, of course, is not Muslim per se, but it's an outer ring. They don't even share common borders with Israel. They've got to go through those Psalm 83 lands to even yeah. get to Israel. Mm -hmm. Why are they not listed in Ezekiel 38? He's very specific about who he lists. Meshach, Tubal, Tagarma, et cetera, by their old names. But he doesn't list Edomites and Ammonites and Moabites, et cetera, uh -huh. that Asaph listed. Two distinctly different prophecies. Then the question comes up, well, is that an oversight? Well, I don't think so. Because he talks about every one of the Psalm 83 populations in one way or another 89 times in his 48 different chapters. But he doesn't mention them once in Ezekiel 38 and 39. But he's very specific about who he does mention. Okay. okay. So I, there's just too many differences 
And okay. also the Lord defeats Ezekiel 38 and 39 through fire, hail, and brimstone. It's clear the Lord does it. Yeah. And, and the reason it says in Ezekiel 39, verse 7, um, that the nation shall know, I will uphold my holy name in the midst of my people Israel. The nation shall know I am the Lord, and they shall not profane my name anymore. Amen. Okay. Oh. That is a big event, but it's preceded by Psalm 83. Okay. So looking at my little timeline up here, where does the Psalm 83 war occur roughly? I think your finger's pretty much close to it because I think we are 65 years deep into the end times as I stated at the beginning yeah. of the program. And like I said, when these prophecies happen, one triggers the other to follow in in a vacuum soon and sequentially. So I would say we are right about where your finger is. Okay. Psalm 83. Psalm 83 will be a, a war which the Israelis themselves will beat back and defeat. And... I put in the subtitle, How Israel Becomes the Next Midi Superpower. They will stretch out their elbows, and, take and I show the territory. prophecies that they'll expand territorially, just like they did in 1967, just yeah. like King David did 3,000 years ago, and Joshua did 3,300 years ago. Okay, so if Psalm 83 war is about here, then how much time before we hit... Ezekiel 38, 39 war. Uh, well, I, they have to dwell securely. They have to tear down the 403-mile wall that separates uh, the West Bank, Palestinian terror out of Israel proper. But it won't take a lot of time. I think Russia's going to muster that hatred that will be developing from the other Muslim countries like Iran and Turkey and them. It'll probably happen pretty quickly behind Psalm 83. But I also put Ezekiel 38 happening and concluding at least three and a half years before the tribulation because in Ezekiel 39, they're burning weapons for seven years. Right. The, for three and a half years before the tribulation, there'll be no problem converting the fuel, the weapons into fuel. The first half of the tribulation, which is characterized by a time of peace, false peace in Israel, they could continue to convert fuel and burn weapons. But even Christ warns them in Matthew 24, 15, when they see the abomination of desolation, to get out of there, to flee yeah. to the mountains, and they're fleeing, they're not necessarily converting fuel. Yeah. Okay, so then I've heard many prophet teachers tell us that the Ezekiel 38-39 war comes just before the beginning of the seven-year tribulation period. And the, the thought is that God intervenes, and boy, read it, Ezekiel 38-39, he rains 100-pound oh, hailstones down on him and an overflowing flood, and God wins the war of 38-39, yes, Ezekiel, for Israel. And the world would be so shocked and so taken aback till <laughs> now they're ready to, to, to uh, sign. They'll say, oh, poor little Israel, almost another holocaust. Let's sign a seven-year peace treaty, okay? And I don't care what your position is. If we're here or not here, the day that some political leader from a revived Roman Empire signs a seven-year peace treaty, peace treaty with Israel, it begins the 70th week of Daniel, okay? And uh, that just begins to make a lot of sense. Now then you've got the first three and a half years, uh, probably pretty peaceful. Uh, they'll get to rebuild the temple. He'll be lauded, I think, as a man of great peace. Finally, he made peace between the Jews and the Arabs. My goodness, what a miracle. And uh, they let him build, rebuild the temple. There's an interesting scripture in Ezekiel, about 44, and in the Living Bible, oh boy, if I can find it real quick, it says something like in the, in the rebuilt tabernacle, temple, it says, they build their heathen temples next door to mine with only a wall in between. Very interesting. I have stood... Ern, you've been up there, I'm sure. That platform of the Temple Mount, the big old mosque of Omar with the golden dome, that's not where Solomon's temple was. It was further north, right behind the eastern gate. And there's a big empty place right there, perfect place to rebuild the temple for the Jews. And that will happen, by yes, the way. Yes, it will. And uh, Ezekiel, I've got it underlined there in my living Bible. It reads perfectly in the, in the living Bible. Yes, here it is, uh, Ezekiel 43, verse 8. I'm reading from the Living Bible. They, you, if you'll read this whole passage, it's 
the measurements and everything for the rebuilding of the temple. And the Living Bible says, they build their idol temples beside mine with only a wall between and worshiped their idols. Well, that old golden dome of Omar, that's an idol temple. Sure it is. Oh, yeah. That's, mm -hmm. And that's not where Solomon's temple was. The temple will be rebuilt, and it'll start when the peace treaty is signed with Israel, securing their borders and their peace for seven <laughs> years. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I hope to be gone at that point. <laughs> I hope Erwin is wrong. <laughs> and I hope Bill is right. And Hal Lindsey, of course, uh, is pre-trib and he'll... You know, what's so interesting, and, and Jan brought this out in our little discussion 28 years ago. 20, yeah, 28 years ago. Erwin will have you believing post-trib, and uh, Bill will have you believing pre-trib. If Dr. McBurney were here, and I know there are plenty of folks that believe in a mid-trib, maybe the Lord left it a little ambiguous so that we would all have to work it out together in agape love. <laughs> and, and just like the Lord said to me, just be ready. Yeah. Just be ready. Yeah. Anyway, um, Bill, go ahead. Finish up on Psalm 83 now. You, I, you, you started, but you haven't finished yet. We've got a few minutes left. Yes. Um, they're going to come together in a final confederacy, these Arab populations that I mentioned to you. They are going to try to destroy Israel, but Israel will win. The Israeli Defense Forces have, have grown, grown up in, against the wars in 48, 67, and 73. They're ranked number 10 among world armies right now. There are numerous, numerous passages that talk about the Israeli Defense Forces. For instance... Uh, Ezekiel 37.10 says that they will become an exceedingly great army. Ezekiel 25.14, I will execute my vengeance on Edom. Edom's in Psalm 83. By the hand of my people Israel, they shall know my vengeance and fury. And Edom is just across the Jordan River in what is now Jordan. Jordan. Yeah, it was in southern Jordan. But the Edomites were uh, fathered by Esau, Jacob's twin brother, yes. Ezekiel 36. And through waves of migration, they made their way into Israel through around Hebron, starting back from the time of the Babylonian conquest, and the, the Greek name for them became the Idumeans. Uh -huh. Today, yeah, the yeah. Palestinian refugees have ethnical representation of the Edomites within them. Not all Palestinians are Edomites. You've got Ammonites and Moabites and Gigabites and Termites and... <laughs> but, oh, yeah. but, all the ites. <laughs> all kinds of ites. But the thing is that I think it's clearly talking about the very first person involved in Psalm 83 of the ten members, which is significant, like the star, the credits of the stars at the end of a movie, is the tents of Edom in a habitation condition. These are, to me, are Palestinian refugees, because biblically when you see tents of, it's either dealing with military encampments or refugee Christ, uh, conditions. Yeah. It's, their, it's their plight, the Palestinian plight. Yeah. Give us another state. Give us the pastors of God for a possession. We're watching it unfold on the news right now. Yes, sir. There's a calm before the storm, but there's a war coming. And it's going to be a big climactic concluding Arab-Israeli war. And God is going to empower the Israeli Defense Forces. Obadiah 118, the house of Jacob will be a fire. Read that as the IDF. The house of Joseph will be a flame. Read that as an IDF. But the house of Esau shall be stubble, and no survivor shall remain. So, the Psalm 83, or we very likely will be here to, to view it, won't we? We, the rapture could occur before, during, or after Psalm 83, but I believe it occurs before the tribulation you've got marked up there. But even before Psalm 83? It could, the rapture could come before Psalm 83. Um, I'd, the rapture to me is a signless event. It's an imminent, yeah. and it could happen at any given moment, and that we should be redeeming the time like we're doing right now. Every moment we should be redeeming the time like Jonathan and Irvin are doing, telling people about the prophecies, telling, introducing people to Jesus Christ. Okay, I, you know what? I'll give the Lord a little advice right now. <laughs> Go ahead and let that Psalm 83 happen, because, brother, we could have a revival and an ingathering of souls after that. It would scare the devil out of everybody. Right. right. And we would win multitudes, wouldn't we? To, amen? Did, have I got a witness out there? Yes. Let's, let's believe it, that God will let us 
be here to that could also trigger the what the the latter reign of Joel chapter 2 and and uh, the whole world would certainly be wide awake uh, as to this Bible and what its prophetic implications are. Dr. Crouch, there's peripheral prophecies that have to be connected to Psalm 83. Isaiah 17, 1, the burden against Damascus. Behold, Damascus will cease from being a city. It will be a ruinous heap, we're told. Verse 9, yeah, yeah. it says this happens in self-defense by the, there's desolation because the children of Israel. Verse 14, Isaiah 17, at eventide you see him, speaking of Damascus in the masculine pronoun, but in the morning he is no more. This is the portion of those who rob us and those who plunder us. Damascus is the oldest continuously inhabited city in recorded history. It's the yeah. capital of Syria. It's in shambles right now with what's going on with the Syrian revolution. Yeah. Someday, Damascus is gonna cease to be a city. It's gonna be a ruinous heap. And, and this, there's concerns that it happens overnight and Israel has nuclear weapons and in self-defense. Do you, do you believe so, Israel could be the verse nine, power? Verse 9 is clear to me. Some people think it was the Assyrian Empire in 722 or 732 B.C., but Isaiah mentions Assyria 37 times in the 66 passages. It doesn't mention them once in Isaiah 17, but he says there's desolation caused by the children of Israel. Wow. Because self-defense, when you read the whole passage, Israel's not the aggressor here. Israel's the defense of their survival. Wow. Oh. Dear Lord, isn't it something that we are alive in this period of time? Just, I, I believe, you know what? I believe most of you and even myself are going to cheat the undertaker. <laughs> we'll be alive when the trumpet sounds or if we go through the tribulation. He'll, he'll go with us, won't he? Jonathan, you've been listening yeah. here uh, from the... Point of Israel. Uh, any thoughts as to what Brother Bill has been <clears throat> talking yeah, well, about? Well, well, yeah. The Lord promises to to keep Israel no matter what, yeah. and and this is the constant history. And the fact that we're living to watch God's promises come true is awesome. Yeah. We know that the enemy's against Israel. We know for, for 4,000 years he's been trying to wipe them out. And that's a sign that the enemy exists, God exists. Yeah. But, you know, all, these, all the nations that have tried, you know, you've got, you've got Egypt, it's fallen. Rome has fallen. Babylon has fallen. Assyria has fallen. Nazi Germany has fallen. All, they have all fallen, mm -hmm. but the nation of Israel lives. The God of Israel lives. <laughs> wow. The people of Israel live. The Messiah of Israel lives. The Word of God lives. Glory. God is awesome. He's on the throne. He's Amen. real. That's what we're seeing. He's the God of prophecy. He's real. He's in everything. Amen. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. You're about to get me happy here tonight. I'm, <laughs> Lord, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Yeah. Erwin, we're nearing the end of the program. Give us a final wrap up here. Well, the one thing I'd like to say Jesus prophesied about the political situation that's developing right now in Israel. President Obama was in Israel last week pressuring Israel to give up the settlements, the area called Judea. I know. Jesus prophesied about Judea in Matthew 24, 15 and 16. He said, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso reads, let him understand. Then let those which be in Judea flee. The big question right now about the 350,000 Jews that live in Judea tonight is how do we get a peace deal turn the West Bank into a homeland for the Palestinians, what do we do with these 350,000 Jews yeah. who say, we're not leaving, this is our promised land? Yeah. Salam Fayyad, the prime minister of the Palestinians, came up with the answer. He said they don't have to leave. There's a million Palestinians living in Israel under Israeli government. They can stay here as a Jewish minority under the Palestinian government. And that's what's getting ready to happen. Uh -huh. Apparently, even Prime Minister Netanyahu is now for that because you can't carry 350,000 Jews out once this peace treaty is signed. But Jesus said, okay, you'll strike that deal at the beginning of the seven years. But three and a half years later, there's going to be something about the Antichrist asserting he's the ultimate authority on the Temple Mount that's going to mm -hmm. ignite the passion of the Palestinians. And the Bible says, if you're out there at the abomination of desolation, when you see the Antichrist stand on that Temple Mount claiming to be Messiah and God, you better hit the ground running. Well, it's, it's going to activate the Jews. You yes. Know, not the Palestinians. No, no. It's going to activate the anger of the Palestinians. Oh, the anger. And they're going to start slaughtering the Jews. Oh. Jesus said, 
If you're on your housetop, don't even come down to your house to grab your clothes. Hit the ground running because then shall be great tribulation such as never has been before nor ever again shall Whoa. be. The Palestinians, this whole deal, they never did love the Jews. They never will love the Jews. No. They're going to unleash their anger at that point and they're going to start slaughtering. We have already sent a magazine out to every home, every Jewish home in the West Bank warning them of all this. You have? Yes, we have. My phone rang incessantly for two weeks. Whoa. Now we're going to send another one out, but when they run for their lives, the ones who believe us will only run because they believe the prophecy of Jesus. Yeah. This is not an Old Testament prophecy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, when they look over their shoulder and their brethren are being slaughtered, they're going to realize it was the prophecy of Jesus that saved them. I've already told them when you get to Jerusalem, look for the signs that say end time prophecy conference. I'll meet you there. Okay, now where did the Jews run to? They're going to run to Jerusalem. Because Israel will still control Jerusalem all the way up to the Battle of Armageddon. Isn't Jerusalem in? Um, well, but uh, they're going to. It's not the West Bank. It, it's in Judea. It's right on yeah. the edge. It's, well, it's right, right on, on the, the edge. edge of Judea. And they've already built the wall where they want the border to be. Okay. And Israel is not going to give Jerusalem back because the. Uh, world community comes down against Israel at Armageddon in Zechariah 14.2. I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. Yes. And in that battle, the battle of Armageddon, half of the city will go into captivity, which means the whole city was under Jewish control prior to that battle. Had to be. Yes. yes. So, when they, but let me go back to what happens when they run for their lives. The reason we're starting this Jerusalem Prophecy College is because when they run for their lives, Oh, they're going to come to our prophecy conference, and I'm going, to, I'm going to say to them, look, Jesus just saved your physical life. Let me tell you about eternal life through Jesus Christ. And there was a pretty good little revival started in Jerusalem a couple of thousand years ago, and I believe God's going to do it again. Wow. I believe God, and I found a scripture that says He will. Where? In Zechariah 12, 7, it says, God will save the tents of Judah first. Uh -huh. We know there's a revival here when all of Israel will turn to the Lord. Yes. But he said, I'm going to save the tents of Judah first, lest Israel boast against Judah. Because the Jews of Israel proper look down their nose at the settlers. They look at them as religious extremists that are yeah. threatening the existence of the state of Israel. So we are opening the Jerusalem Prophecy College this fall. I'm going there in a month attempting to buy some property so we can have the Jerusalem Prophecy College. And then when we're going to reach the Jews, we're hoping to use your studio looking over Judea, looking over the Temple Mount. You got it. Hallelujah. <laughs> and the Bible says at this time, you've already talked about it, uh, Daniel chapter number 11, verse 31 through 33, that the Antichrist will corrupt many by flatteries, but the people that do know their God shall be strong oh, yes. and do exploits. Yes. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many. That's the reason there's going to be a Jerusalem prophecy college, a revival in Israel, and a great end time revival. Thrust in thy sickle and reap. That's it. For the harvest Hallelujah. of the earth is ready for its reaping. Oh my Lord, I'm about to get happy again here. <laughs> Now, I've, I've always heard that the Jews at that point would flee and run to Petra. Uh, that's not biblical. Really? You cannot hide in Petra. Maximum population of 800. Tourist attraction, thousands going through there every day. There's yeah. not one scripture for Petra. The Bible tells us where they flee. Revelation chapter 12, verse 14. When the dragon persecutes the woman of Israel... At the beginning of the Great Tribulation, the Bible says there was given to the woman two wings of a great eagle, speaking of the United States, I believe, yeah. that will uh, carry her away into her place. Where is Israel's place? It's her promised land. Of course. She hasn't fled from there because she's still there at the Battle of Armageddon. Yes. So, in order for the world community to come down against Israel at Armageddon, they've got to still be in Israel. Is that's her place, and the U.S. Eagle is using our veto power at the United Nations to yeah. protect Israel. So Israel is going to be right there, and the Antichrist will never rule Israel. The Bible says that he will come and try to invade at Armageddon. You don't try to invade a place that you already control. No. So consequently, we're going to be there during this time, and it's going to be, there's two nations that the Antichrist will never invade, Jordan and Israel. Daniel 11, 41, the children of Edom, Moab, and Ammon shall escape. Ammon is Amman, Jordan, that's their capital. Yes. The Moab Mountains are in southern Jordan. 
So Jordan and Israel are our two best friends. Yeah. And the United States is not depicted in the world government in Revelation 13. Every item from the modern nations from Daniel 7 is carried over to Revelation 13 except for the eagle. We're Israel's friend. We're Jordan's friend. I'm praying that when this judgment comes in the form of a war that kills one-third of mankind and the United States may lose 20 million, I'm praying that's going to drive us to repentance and put back people who know the Bible and allow us to be a friend to Israel and Jordan till the well, end and be a place of safety in the last days here. There will be then a multitude of tribulation saints who come to faith in Jesus Christ during the horrible seven years yes. and who, because they've watch TBN. They didn't take the mark of the beast, and uh, they may have missed the rapture, but... Well, Jonathan has something to say, or he's going to jump off his oh, chair. No. Okay. okay, go ahead. We got just, one minute. Just wanna, I just want to say one thing. There's a lot we can say, but I want to say one thing, because when you talk about the end times, you talk about judgment, people are scared. And they say, you know, should I build a bomb shelter? What should I do to be safe? Yeah. And I want to say in the Hebrew, the word for safety is Yeshua. Yeah. And the, Yeshua is hey, Jesus. You want it, the only way to be safe is if you're not in Him, get in Him. Amen. If you are in Him, don't fear. He so, is our safety. So you're Yeshua. not uh, stirring up freeze-dried food with a 20-year shelf life and uh, uh, pure water little. and... Uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. I know, I know where I am. You know, and Yeshua is our safety. Oh, Jesus. dear friends. Jesus. Get in Jesus. That's it. Praise God. Amen. 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 Put everybody's little uh, web address up for those of you that want to get in touch with Brother Baxter, Brother Khan, Brother uh, Salas, and uh, mm. Mikey, Michael Perky is going to take me out with my, my favorite, favorite song. Everybody, did you enjoy this tonight? Yeah. Did, shall we do it again? Come on, everybody. Go with me to Beulah Land.
is gonna end inside. Listen, listen. There's just a few more days I gotta labor. And we're all gonna take. We're so glad you've been with us for Praise the Lord. TBN has a worldwide ministry. We need your love gifts, large or small, to help keep the gospel of Jesus Christ going around the world. So write today. Praise the Lord, P.O. Box A, Santa Ana, California, 92711. Or in Canada, write TBN, P.O. Box 768, Station B, Ottawa, Ontario, K1P, 5P8. If you haven't asked Christ into your life, call a prayer partner now and pray to receive Jesus as Savior and Lord. Now until next time, remember to praise the Lord. This program has been brought to you through the prayers and contributions of our faithful partners throughout North America and the world.